Okay, so we'll be talking about uh, history taking and diagnostic test. Uh, there are lots of slides, we don't necessarily need to go through all of them. Uh, I'd like to try to make this a little bit interactive, or at least for the diagnostic test. So we're just going to go through two different templates. The history will be just uh, uh, in the template of who wants to be a millionaire. Um, this is not necessarily interactive, it's just to kind of present inf information in a, in a fun way. But the uh, diagnostic test is like a, a game of Clue, and so I'll try to get you involved in this. Okay, if you just want to write down my email there, uh, if, in case you want to have a copy of the, of the handout. Just before we get into it, I just would like to um, go over a little bit of my information about my specialty. Um, so there are seven main, main groups uh, in Australia, Asia, Europe, and North America um, that make up the World, Congre uh, the, the World Association for Retinal Dermatology. Um, one of these groups is the American College of Retinal Dermatology, and so uh, like Michael was saying, about 11 uh, board certified uh, dermatologists in Canada uh, out of the 235, so the rest is mostly in the U.S., but a little bit everywhere. There's also a local uh, group, the Canadian Academy of Veterinary Dermatology. And so that you know, every four years, we do organize a, a very large conference called the World Congress, and it will be taking place July 24 to 28 um, in the East Wing of the Vancouver Con Convention Center. Unfortunately, um, we, we were initially hoping to have an OSIS program, but I don't, I don't think it's, uh, it's going to happen. But there should be uh, some good information for veterinary technicians anyway, and, and some workshops, including cytology and parasitology workshops. There's also a newsletter that we put out. I don't know if uh, you guys are familiar with this, but um, it gets uh, mailed every three months to most of the clinics in, in British Columbia. So that's the history. The history. Uh, okay. So who wants to be a good uh, dermatological history taker? Do you guys typically take histories for, for your doctors? Um, so I'll just go over about basically 14 main questions uh, that. Uh, uh, need to be asked if, if you have the time. It does take uh, a while to, to take a good history. So that's just uh, all based on the on that movie, The Slum Duck Millionaire. So the breed of the patient is important because, for example, alopecia, which is um, also known as environmental allergies or canine atopic dermatitis, is is very common in certain certain breeds. I certainly see a lot of sheep strips, for example, but the labs and the goldens. And, and and the Westies. Uh, so the breed is, is important uh, for, for an, uh, an allergic skin disease such as uh, atopy. Sebaceous cytomyelitis, which is um, a skin disease that affects the sebaceous glands and that causes hair loss, um, is, for example, very common in, in poodles and vislas. So again, the breed is important. Uh, alopecia X, which is another um, skin disease with alopecia, is, is very common in the Pomeranian. Um, and ringworm uh, is, as you all know, very common in the Persian cat. Um, do you guys know the equivalent of um, the Persian in, in the dog for, for ringworm? What, what would be a, a, a small breed that commonly has uh, dermatophytes as well? So the Yorkie is kind of the equivalent of the Persian in, in, in the dog. Another really important question is to find out how old the patient was when the skin disease developed. <coughs> Typically, the very young patients are, are affected by parasites. So that's uh, the perfect example is uh, your mites and puppies and kittens. Um, allergies tend to affect young, young adults. Um, middle age is typically more uh, the endocrine diseases like Cushing's or hypothyroidism, um, while obviously neoplasia needs to be considered in older patients. How long has the disease been present and how did it progress? So an acute onset, for example, would be indicative of, of scabies. So if you see a dog that is extremely pruritic, um, and typically you'll see lesions at the margin of the pinna, uh, the elbows and the hocks, and that's usually a very acute onset. That would be a perfect example of, of a dog with scabies. Allergies tend to kind of get worse progressively. So it does take a few months, a few years to kind of get to the, to the peak. 
Um, so you might want to express this in days and weeks and months or years, but you know you need to know how long the present the disease has been present. And sometimes you won't have the luxury of finding that out. Right? You know we see a lot of uh, stray and rescue dogs, and you have no no history, so you have to kind of assume in a lot of cases it's chronic if you see like canification, hyperpigmentation, um, but you probably won't know exactly how long it's been going on. So where on the body did the problem start? So ears, feet, face, um, very typical of allergies. So if you have paritis in these areas, you should probably assume it's, it's an allergy. Sometimes it's just the ears, and that could be a polyp in a cat, um, um, a tumor in the ear canal, it could, could be a foreign body, uh, could also be an allergy. Sometimes allergies only affect the ears, it could be ear mites. Uh, Pododermatitis, that's a present coming, uh, present, uh, it's common presentation, so it's just, just uh, um, the feet that are affected. And the nails, there are some, some diseases that affect the nails only. So is the animal itchy? Um, that's really important because if you are uh, seeing a patient for paritis, you know, until proven otherwise, it's a parasite or, or an allergy. Um, if you have no paritis and, and alopecia, that's what I was uh, talking about with the doctors next door, it's probably going to be a whole set of, of skin diseases. Okay, So licking, uh, licking, biting, chewing of the feet, very typical of allergies. Rubbing the face on the carpet, on the furniture. Shaking the head, scratching the ears, that's uh, the clinical symptoms of otitis. Um, or scratching anywhere on the body. Is the, the disease seasonal? Um, for example, if it's a warm weather or seasonal problem, you'd be concerned about fleas or pollens, and it can be trees, grasses, weeds. If it's a strictly year-round problem, then you might want to be considering more of a, a food allergy or, um, more importantly, a house dust mite allergy. It's an allergy to the indoor environment. If it's a year-round problem that exacerbates in the warm weather months, you might want to consider a combination of the, of the above. It could be an allergy to the other environment, the indoor environment. It could be fleas, it could be food. Could be scabies. You need to kind of consider uh, all of the, all of the possibilities. And uh, sometimes the disease is year round and actually gets worse in the winter months. And that's especially true in houses with um, carpeting, lots of carpeting, rugs, uh, forced air heating, um, and uh, dogs that are mostly indoors. And that's typically how some dogs with uh, house dust mite allergies would behave. So. They tend to get a little worse in the winter. So are there non-dermatological signs? For example, in atopy or environmentology, just think hay fever type of symptoms. So sneezing, conjunctivitis could be coughing as well. With a food allergy, typically you'll have uh, gastrointestinal symptoms. Vomiting, diarrhea, increased fecal frequency, that would be a patient that goes to the bathroom three, four, five, six times a day. That's a little bit uh, excessive um, polyuria, polydipsia, uh, polyphagia would be indicative of um, endocrine disease, and a weight loss could, could indicate um, cancer. So you want to know what the diet is, um, and that sometimes is a little, a little bit difficult to find out exactly. You need to ask about treats, you need to ask about dry food, canned food. Um, any table scraps. Um, in the case of a, of a year-round um, paritis, you need to know, you know what, if a special diet or high polygenic diet was used in the past, if it was raw, home-cooked, if it was commercial, if it was over-the-counter, uh, if it was by prescription, and was it fed correctly? Was it done very strictly for a period of uh, six to ten weeks like, uh, like it's supposed to do? So typically, the um, focus is on proteins and carbohydrates. Um, for example, the, the, the major uh, proteins that cause allergy, allergies in, in dogs and cats would be chicken, beef, and seafood. That's mostly the case in, in cats. But it could also be the carbohydrates. And so we're talking about all the grains, corn, wheat, rice, barley, oats. So you know, ideally, you'd use a, 
a grain-free diet. And typically a grain-free diet means a diet that contains sweet potato or potato uh, or green pea. You want to also find out if the diet uh, was a novel protein diet or a hydrolyzed protein diet. So a hydrolyzed protein diet is, for example, Hill ZD. That's a hydrolyzed chicken-based diet. So the protein has been broken down into very small uh, um, molecules, and it shouldn't, it shouldn't cause allergic reactions. Now, there's no guarantee it's hydrolyzed you know, 100%, but it should, in theory, help most of the dogs with, uh, with a food allergy. There's also a couple hydrolyzed soy diets. Um, and purine IHA and Rylcanin uh, HP are, are the examples. Okay, but don't forget to ask about treats, any supplements, any medications that could be flavored. Typically, you know, if it's brown, if it has a smell, it's flavored. If it's a yeast flavor, I guess it's probably okay. But if it's a beef or chicken flavor, um, and you're trying to move away from these proteins, you're basically ruining uh, the whole process. So um, yeah, it's the importance of the bad history. Are there any other animals in the household um, you know, that you kind of have to think here about uh, uh, contagious skin diseases? Perfect examples are scabies and dermatophytosis or ringworm. Uh, think about uh, any new pet that would have been introduced to the household, and um, especially in the, in the case of Persian cats. Um, are there any asymptomatic carriers? Like, um, that's another possibility too. And you can have persons with no skin lesions and they carry ringworm and they may infect other cats. Contagion can also happen to the owners. Um, there are lots of zoonoses, uh, zoonoses in, in dermatology. Uh, perfect example would be again scabies, dermatophytosis, protrichosis, um, and then more recently. Uh, what has been recognized is the uh, um, problem of MRSC, so which is an antibiotic resistant strain of Staph aureus, which goes back and forth between people and, and dogs. Fortunately, still fairly rare in dogs. There are other strains of, of Staph uh, that, are, that can be found in, in dogs, but typically uh, Staph aureus is, is, um, is rare. So was the disease treated before? So this, for example, um, um, when people get frustrated with skin diseases, uh, when they want to, uh, you know, they may just elect to get for, uh, to go to another clinic for second opinions. So you kind of need to get the records from the previous uh, clinic and find out if the disease was treated and if the drugs were, um, were used correctly and, and also to find out if the treatment worked or didn't work. Uh, I mean, if it's not responsive to antibiotic, unless there is a resistance uh, of the bacteria to, to the antibiotic, it probably means that it wasn't a bacterial infection. So uh, likewise, uh, a response to steroids uh, um, would be helpful to know about, because uh, typically allergies respond to steroids, whereas in other cases, steroids may be contraindicated and may, may make the disease worse. Okay, so the main groups of uh, treatments uh, or medications that are used in veterinary dermatology are the antipyretics. So you've got cyclosporine or topica. You have antihistamines like reactin and Benadryl, and prednisone, prednisone, dexamethasone. So the steroids are very commonly used. Antibiotics, typically cephaloxin, clonamycin, clavamox, um, betryl, uh, antifungals, so ketoconazole, etraconazole. And then you also need to know if, it's, if the treatments were oral versus topical. So obviously you use a lot of creams and ointments and shampoos and sprays and spot-ons. Uh, flea control, extremely important. I mean, we are uh, on the coast of British Columbia and fleas are seen year-round. I mean, obviously they're a lot more active at certain times of the year, but I have seen fleas in January or February, so we're... We are in a temperate climate, uh, so it's very different from the rest of, of, of Canada. There are multiple um, uh, drugs that are used, Advantage, Advantage Multi, Canine Advantix, Revolution, Sentinel Program, Interceptor, there's a new, uh, a new one, I um, uh, can't think of the name right now, but it's, a, it's a, another oral medication. And then you also have a whole bunch of over-the-counter products. 